Um, so again, welcome everyone. Um, uh, this is the diversity, equity, and inclusion webinar. Um, and just getting started, you know, we know that MRA teams are some of the highest trained and skilled rescue teams in the country. Um, we are the experts in mountain rescue in North America, volunteering our time to help others. You know, as professionals, as professional volunteers, we seek to continue education and training for both ourselves and our teams uh, in order to keep skills, to keep our skills at the highest level. As part of our continued professional development, uh, the MRA has sponsored this webinar to provide information, education, and awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion for our members and teams. The MRA uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee hired Joan Park to tailor this webinar for the MRA. Joan has over 25 years of experience in consulting in both corporate and personal development. Joan is also an adjunct professor at the CU Denver, uh, Denver Business School and has a vast knowledge and lived experience in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Uh, we will have a uh, we'll have question and answer at the end, and if you have a question, please put that in the chat and preface it preface it with uh, the word question in all caps, and I'll put that in the chat as we go. Uh, and with that, please welcome Joan Park. Thank you, Doug. Um, I hope I'm coming across okay, and everyone's seeing the uh, the screen that I'm sharing. So can I? Get a quick thumbs up from Linda or Doug. Okay, we're good. Thanks for the introduction, Doug. And it's a pleasure to be here um, on a Thursday evening. My first job uh, will be to make sure that you, I keep you guys awake. I'm sure you guys had a long, hard week. So my job is to keep you awake, keep you engaged and entertained for the next 90 minutes before we get to uh, question and answers portion. So as we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. A little further um, to let you know who exactly is talking to you tonight. Um, this is what I do. Uh, there are five major titles that live in live on my business card or my email signature on or on my website. Uh, my undergrad is from a uh, Parsons School of Design, New York City. I started my career as a as a designer, communication designer, and I, I received my MBA at University of Colorado Denver, where I'm currently teaching. I actually started my business coming out of MBA program uh, back in 2005, and I ran multiple businesses uh, for about 11 years before I had to shut things down due to health reasons back in 2016 and get back to full-time consulting. Uh, that's what I do. That's my background, strategic consulting. Currently, I'm serving a K-12 through school district here in Colorado, but I have uh, served Fortune 500 companies, startups, and nonprofit organization as well. I teach uh, entrepreneurship, personal branding, marketing, and leadership at University of Colorado Denver. I mainly teach in the MBA program, professional one year and the executive MBA program. And I teach one undergrad class because I'm forced to, uh, because I just don't have the patience for undergrad students. But over the last few years that I've been teaching undergrad classes, um, they're really teaching me not only patience, but how to teach more effectively. So I'm really enjoying uh, teaching my undergrad classes now. Now, who I am is quite different. Uh, first and foremost, I am a father of these two children. My daughter, Madison is 16 years old and I am completely clueless as to how uh, I need to raise her and what kind of father I need to be for my daughter because I've never been a 16 year old girl and I'm relying heavily on my, on my wife uh, and her experience to make sure I am the kind of dad that my daughter wants and needs and not the kind of dad that I think I should be. My son, Mateo, is nine years old. He still keeps things very simple for us. Um, and he thinks I'm the funniest person in the world because I tell poop jokes. Uh, I've been married to my wife for 26 years, going on 27. Uh, she is a high school guidance counselor and a very... Very patient woman, obviously, because she's been married to me for 27 years. I'm the oldest and only son to my mother. My father has passed about six years ago. 
and I'm the old, uh, older brother to my do uh, my sister, uh, who is a hardcore New Yorker who never wanted to leave New York, but with the COVID and some of the racial attacks that's been happening, she finally decided to leave New, uh, leave New York and join us here in Colorado. So in a nutshell, that's who I am. Now, what I am is a bit of a shit show. Um, I identify as Asian uh, by race, but my citizenship uh, is uh, with United States, so I'm an American citizen. But culturally speaking, I identify uh, as a Korean New Yorker. Uh, there, I was born and raised in Korea until I was 13 years old, and my family moved to New York, and that's where I grew up. So I've, I've lived all my life living in between these two cultures and the worlds where some things made, made sense and some things simply didn't. And I was conditioned to uh, think about different ways of looking at things because I was a foreigner living in a country where I was much of an outsider because I didn't speak a language for the first few years. So I couldn't help but to observe. And over the years, they became a, a natural instinct for me to simply observe things and look at it from two different lenses. Now that I live in Denver, I have three different lenses, if you will, from a cultural perspective, because it was quite a cultural shock when I moved here uh, from New York back in 2000, and I married a, a Coloradan, native Coloradan, who constantly reminds me that I should stop thinking and saying and acting the way I did in New York, because this is Colorado, and those things aren't cool anymore here. So. By nurture, I look at things in very different perspectives, uh, sometimes as an outsider perspective, sometimes as a, as a perspective that's skewed and removed from what is actually happening. So when I got involved with this work of equity, inclusion, and diversity, what I've noticed was that these three terms were being used interchangeably and sometimes together, um, but people really didn't know how these things work independently as well as um, independently uh, together with the other uh, components. So the first thing I really did was approaching this work, I looked at what each of those components were, how they should be defined. Um, this work is very difficult. Um, as of late, there's a lot more movement towards and awareness of this work that's happening. And there's a lot of clutter and, and noise out there as well. So I wanted to bring some clarity into this. But one thing that I, I want to make sure that I share with you before we get started is that this is difficult work and this is complex and it requires messy and difficult and challenging conversations and a lot of deep thinking. So there is no simple solution to this. Uh, this is a complex problem, therefore, uh, no simple solution is going to do it justice. What we can do is really understand and dig deep in each of those, each of these components and then embrace the importance of the, this work within our own culture and organization and do our part. Now, when I started school in New York, one of the first things I had to do sitting in the class is look up every single work in the textbook in my trusty old English Korean dictionary. It's a good habit of mine. Uh, I didn't think it was gonna be such a good habit. It was annoying as hell back then. But now, anytime and every time I approach any new work, that's exactly where I go to start. I look up things in dictionary just to understand the root of where things come from. And equity originally came from the old French word and it really meant equal or just. It talked about fairness in its origination. But in the 16th century, it took a bit of a, a slight turn as to how this word was being used. And it, talked, it spoke more of individuals' legal rights and claims to things. In the 20th century, it, it's, it pivoted again and it became more of a financial and asset ownership. And I think this is for the most part how we use a term um, in, in main culture here, popular culture. Uh, we, we talk about the equity in terms of home equity or equity within a company from a, a stock perspective. Obviously, in, in, in our case, we'll be talking about a different definition of equity, and then I'll cover that, cover that in, a, in a second. Oftentimes, people confuse equality and equity, um, and those are two very different things. So as you can see in, in, in this cartoon, equality means everyone gets the same thing, but that doesn't necessarily 
uh, equate to or mean equity. It doesn't define it. Equity is really delivering what each person needs based on his or hers or their needs and requirements. So it's not one size fit all. And as an outsider, it was interesting uh, for me to think about what would that mean in, in the world of mountain rescue? Uh, it would be as ridiculous as uh, providing the same equipment for all rescues when we're talking about specifically equality. And I don't think that would make sense because um, as far as I'm, I can tell as an outsider looking in, I believe you guys have appropriate equipment for each rescue because each rescue is different. It has uh, different needs and requirements. So equity in this perspective is really understanding each situation, each person, and then figuring out what that person or what that situation needs. In the simplest terms, because I'm a simple person, to me, equity means meeting each person where they are. It's not expecting the person to be where you are or expecting everyone to be exactly where you are or where the majority is because everyone is at different places in their lives. Now, with the help of Linda and Doug, we conducted a survey before this webinar just to get the, the climate and the landscape of where MRA members are when it comes to the equity, inclusion, and diversity work. And this is one of my favorite definitions uh, of equity that your fellow team member or MRA member has provided when we asked a question, how do you define equity? This person said, equity means having organizational level and team level policies that take into account historical and current aspects of advantaged and disadvantaged groups in order to help treatment of everyone be consistent and positive. So this person defined equity just the way I had imagined and I defined it, which is, again, it depends on the organizational level as well as the team level and individual level to make sure that it's consistent and moving towards a positive direction. Inclusion, according to the dictionary, is pretty simple. It's act of including. But when we get into the mathematical definition of inclusion, it exposes something that we don't always consider or talk about when it comes to inclusion. Inclusion in mathematics means that all the members of the first are the members of the second. So both groups include the same members. They're included. But when we look at what is known as strict inclusion, it's not the case. In this definition, the relation that obtains between two sets. So that there are two groups. The, the first group includes the groups of the second, but the second group doesn't include the groups, the members from the first. So in this case, it's not really inclusion, not in a holistic sense, but there's a bit of exclusion taking place. And this is something that we got to dive in a little deeper as we go on with this very important work. Equal rights for others does not mean less rights for you. It's not a pie. There are people out there who are fearful that when you work on equity, inclusion, and diversity, that something will be taken away from them. Well, that's a very deficit-minded approach. You have your rights. Nothing's being taken away. By sharing and allowing others to have the same rights or the rights that they need from an equity perspective doesn't mean that you necessarily have to give up anything that you have. Another thing that we got to talk about is the act of including and what it's like to exclude. Now, some people would say, well, I didn't mean to. That wasn't my intention. So there's a lot of talk about unintentional versus intentional, unconscious bias versus conscious bias, implicit versus explicit. And we can talk about that and they are different and they need to be distinguished. However, the main point that I wanna drive here, whether you meant it or didn't mean it, whether you're talking about a manslaughter or first degree murder, whether you intended to kill somebody or not, the outcome is the same. There's a dead body and somebody has to be responsible for that. So in this case, yes, it is important to talk about whether you intended to exclude someone. But when someone says I've been excluded, your lack of intention doesn't excuse the situation nor negate or justify the outcome of someone feeling excluded. 
So that's a very important point that we need to discuss and keep in mind as we do this very important work of inclusion. And this is a, a survey response again from a fellow MRI member. This person said, inclusion means building a culture where all members feel respected, valued, given the opportunity to lead and grow their skills and feel part of a shared community. I think that's pretty common sense when it comes to a volunteer organization where people volunteer their own times and weekends and nights to save strangers. You guys are in a humanitarian work. So I would imagine that inclusion should be given in a default. So to me, this definition from this member really captured what it should mean to have inclusion in MRA. On the flip side, when I hear things about exclusion, which I've heard in the survey, I really want to ask those members who may be unintentionally or intentionally excluding other members, how exactly exclusion helped carry out MRA's mission of quality, availability, and safety? I don't think exclusion, whether it's intentional or unintentional, helps anything with this mission. If anything, I think it would hurt it. And that's a very honest but difficult conversation that I need to, I, I think we need to have when we're doing this important work. Lastly, diversity. And the straight up de dictionary definition really talks about the point of differences. And that is part of what diversity means. But when we just focus on diversity, it gets pretty interesting. If I were to ask people, to tell me by looking at this picture right here, whether there's enough yellow dots compared to enough purple dots, I think I'll get a varying degrees of answers. Some may even say, what does it matter? What's the point? Why is it important to have yellow dots more than purple dots? Well, if we just focus on diversity for the sake of diversity and talk about having different colors, so to speak, what we do is we miss the big picture. We need to understand the vision, the mission, and the value, and the big picture of what it is that we're involved in, the big vision and the group collective work that we're involved in to understand why diversity should matter. Then we could have a meaningful conversation whether there is enough or not enough diversity within the context of the organization and the culture. So we gotta remember the big picture and the vision and the collective work and the impact that we're doing as an organization before we can have a meaningful conversation about diversity. When diversity is practiced poorly, we often get this type of approach, whether it's through the leadership policies or, or, or culture, cultural norms where you have the diversity and yet you're taking everything away that makes diversity special and force everyone into a bucket. And collectively, you're actually losing. Collectively, you're weaker because you're taking the, the beauty, the strength and the unique talents of individuals and what diversity brings by simply making things equal or forcing people, to, people into a nice, well-designed, simple box. Me, diversity really strengthens. And it's the way nature intended. You guys, now, I'm a New Yorker. I've, I've skied once in my life. Mountain is five minutes away, but I don't get up there very often because it scares me. Um, I like to know where things are coming from, and I'm much comfortable with people, even bad people, than wild animals where I'm, I'm below them in the food chain. So I don't go up there quite off, uh, very often, but you guys are. You guys are in nature, so you should breathe and live this hell of a lot more than I do. So if you are in nature, you see that diversity is everywhere. And the biodiversity is what makes and keeps nature strong and resilient and has been for thousands of years. So this is not new. This is natural. And when we put that biodiversity or the sense of diversity into a team, like a football team, yeah, the head coach is holding the trophy. And I'm sure the quarterback is the good looking guy right next to him, right? And you got the starting members right in the front. But it really does a team, take a team, including the equipment managers. 
the physios, the physical therapists, the trainers, the conditioning trainers, the, those who work on nutrition and diet, the cheerleaders, the parents, the supporters. It does take diversity of roles and responsibilities. It takes different skill sets and unique talents and strengths to come together as a team, not only to win one game, but win championships and have seasons of winning and creating legacy. Sustainability is built into diversity. So when we think about diversity, we have to understand what diversity really means in an organization. So you're not again, approaching it from a simply having enough color dots, but really understanding what diversity diversity should mean within your organization and have a strategy and a tactic that is authentic to the organization. Otherwise you'll get backlash. So this is a definition uh, and an application of what diversity may look like within MRA from one of your fellow members. This person said roles, responsibilities, skills, technologies, tools, and resources can be looked upon as part of the diversity work that we need to embrace. It's not just people, it's not just gender, it's not just race, it's not just age, but all the different things that go into creating an effective and successful team like MRA. So I'd like to introduce you to the framework that I come up with when I got really frustrated with people doing this work, not all of them, but some who approach this work from a purely academic perspective. And, and believe me, I teach at the university, but I like to separate myself from the rest of my colleagues who are tenured, who research and publish good papers. I respect their work, but I like to see if something actually works on the street because I'm an entrepreneur and I get to know that something is pragmatic and practical. So I couldn't take the academic approach, purely academic approach of doing big research. That means little to the people and the organization that are actually going through challenges with this work. And also you have people that may um, had life experiences, and I, I certainly do, of, of experience inequity, exclusion, and lack of diversity in my life. But I don't want this to be a therapy session for me where I just tell you my sob story. I want this to be something that an organization or group of people can take and actually apply to their culture, their organization, with the people they have in there, and make it work for themselves. So this is a framework that I came up with from, from my years of strategic consulting to see if this is, this is something that's pragmatic, that is malleable, so that my clients and, and different organizations that I work with can take this framework and make it their own. And it's really simple. It's a simple linear equation. Equity is the value, is the core of what that organization stands for and the group of individuals that make up that organization. It's the why behind that organization existence and the reason why people get involved with that organization. And you combine that with the inclusion, which is the process. It's the how of carrying out the mindset and the value of equity. And when you combine those two components and they're perfectly aligned, the natural outcome is the kind of diversity that organization needs and would value. So to me, it's a very simple linear uh, relationship um, when it comes to the important work of equity, inclusion, and diversity. So let's get started with what it means to have a value of equity in, a, in an organization. As a consultant, I get paid a lot of money to come in to organization and craft up these beautifully wordsmithed value statements and mission statements. I make a good living doing that. But usually that takes place in the C-suite in an ivory tower. And people throw out words that sound really good. By the time it gets down to the floor, to the front line of employees and staff and customers, it really doesn't mean anything because they weren't involved, right? And these are wordsmithed things that doesn't really mean much. And sometimes people just put it in a frame or bury it under the websites about a section and don't really mean anything by it. They just want to put it out there so they sound smart or they sound like they're doing the right thing. By the way, I stopped taking on those clients who simply want to do things for the sake of doing it because it's not really worth my time. And I can't face my kids saying that, yeah, today I worked on something meaningful, regardless of how much they pay me. It just is not worth doing anymore. 
some of the clients that I've worked with that really got this work wasn't the ones that were driving down and jamming down their values or their perceived values in the, down the throats of their staff. It wasn't mandated from the top. It actually came up through the ground swells of people that make up that organization. And the leadership's role in this is to make sure that they empower and support those that are actually critical part of their organization. So it's not a demand or a directive. They're there to partner, empower, and support what already exists as a value system within the organization. So when it comes to equity portion, why we do what we do, the value, we have to deal with this very fundamental question first. Why is equity even important to your people and your organization? And some may say it's not important at all. And some may say it's important. So that's the first hurdle you got to get over when we talk about equity. How do you reconcile the difference between those who've never experienced inequity, therefore doesn't believe that it's important enough, and those who experience inequity, therefore who wants to make sure that equity exists within this ecosystem? And once that fundamental conversation has taken place, is equity really aligned with your people's and organization's values? People that belong to that organization, is that part of their value system? Do they believe in it? Because if they don't and they're not aligned, you can mandate this through policies, but the likelihood of it sustaining is very low. If people don't believe in the Kool-Aid they're drinking, they're gonna stop drinking at some point, or they may substitute with something else that they're more close to and they prefer. So we have to come up with a definition of what equity looks like, but also equally important, what inequity looks like within their organization so we can name things when things happen. I looked at the five values that are stated on the website of, of MRA. Honesty, professionalism, responsibility, accountability, and integrity. Very, very popular, but important values. There isn't a single value attribute on there that I don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with, where anyone would actually say, yeah, honesty is not that important or is way overrated. They're very good values. So now how would equity play a role in carrying out and operationalizing each of those values within the MRA? So can we do honesty in an equitable way? Can we actually practice integrity in an equitable way? So when we think about the definition of equity and meeting each person where they are, I also came across this, this survey result from a uh, response from one of your members. Mountain Rescue has been an important positive force that has shaped many aspects of my life. I would like anyone who wants to experience it to have the all encompassing opportunities and experiences that MR can bring. Also teams that have rich diversity and true inclusion and equity are stronger, smarter, and safer. I like to truly believe that this person has experienced this and is stating a fact, a fact based on his, her, or their lived truth. The diversity does make the team stronger and smarter and safer. Another way of thinking about values is that it can serve as the North Star of your team of your organization. So that is collectively embraced and practiced. So when you're faced with bad decision and worse, or tough decision and a tougher decision, you actually look at your value of equity or of those five values that you stated to go, what decision do we need to make and carry out so that it's aligned with our value system? So that we are serving and living by and, and working together by the North Star that we serve. The next process, next step, which is the inclusion, the process part. This is a how of the equation. How would you go about achieving equity? Making sure that each person is met where they are. And how inclusive is your plan and process? Looking at your current process of how you do things, whether it's going out on a rescue, being prepared, training, promoting someone to be a leader, training a leader, and grooming a leader, or going out there and recruiting future members. How inclusive is it, the way you do things? 
And how would you measure equity? This is one of the toughest thing. And there is no, absolutely no simple answer to this. Every organization needs to go through its own necessary struggles to figure out how would we go about equity and how would we recognize it when it happens and when it doesn't. One of the things that I like to uh, propose to any organization I work with is having a value system and a value statement is good, but it can't stop there. You have to operationalize it. And, and the next few slides I'm gonna share with you uh, demonstrates how you may go about operationalizing the values that you believe in, that you wanna align everything you do as an organization with it so that ultimately you deliver on your mission. So if the core value of equity or honesty, integrity is in place, and you're working with different teams, you have to make sure that the process itself is inclusive, where each team gets to share their own perspective and their definitions of it, because each team also has their own culture, their own ecosystem. So this can be a mandate. So that core value of the organization and the process has to be shared, but it has to be able to support each team where they are. So it's really walking the talk of the equity. And once those two things come together, each team should be encouraged and empowered and guided to come up with their own metrics to see how they're doing. And the metrics for one team may look very different from another team. And it should be designed that way because no two teams are gonna be alike. So you allow the equity and the inclusion process to be customized per team's needs. And then what you wanna do is make sure the process of inclusion actually happens, not just from the organization and the teams, but amongst the teams themselves. So they can compare notes to see what is working in one team that may be benchmarked by the other team and create this peer learning and peer mentorship amongst the teams so that the process within the organization, from the organization to the teams, but also amongst the teams are truly inclusive. And when you look at the functional silos or functional uh, capabilities of an organization that is required to run the organization, things like leadership approach should embrace the EID framework and lead the branding, the process, the talent acquisition, all those functional areas of the organization, leveraging the process based on the value of equity and making sure that the leaders are walking the talk. When you talk about um, new recruits, for the sake of diversity and having different members join the organization, talent acquisition is only a component of how this ecosystem will thrive. You can get people, but if they don't stay for the right reasons and they constantly leave, then you won't have any sustainable plan and sustainable success to make sure diversity exists and thrives in the organization the way it was meant to. So if you want to re retain the talent that you bring in and the diversity that you bring in, you have to make sure that you are walking the talk and there's a support, environment, culture, and a process to make sure that people would want to stay for the right reasons. This is also a, a great feedback that I received in the survey um, from one of your team members. When it comes to inclusion, this person said, it is a safety issue. And safety, again, is part of the mission statement that you have as an organization. This person goes on to say, if people are not trained to their best, there's a risk. If the most qualified people are not being fielded, there's a risk. If people are afraid to speak out, there's a risk. If people are being harassed and are afraid, there's a risk. If people are being ignored and or marginalized, there's risk. And I don't think this person is specifically talking about the risk to the person who's just being harassed or excluded. I'm pretty sure this person is talking about other team members as well as the subjects that you're training for hours and end and volunteering your time away from your loved ones to save. So I think this is comprehensive and weaved into everything that you do. So exclusion, practice of inequity, and lack of diversity is a safety issue. 
So when we put all these things together in an equation where equity and, and inclusion is combined and delivered together, how would diversity as an outcome look like? The first question we have to ask is, as I said earlier, what is a relevant and meaningful definition of diversity, not only for MRA as an organization, but for each team, because each team's definition may be different from another team when it comes to diversity as to what it means and what is relevant to that. And how would you know when you have successful equity and diversity within your team and organization? What are the things that you're gonna see and experience that are tangible to know that inequity doesn't exist, that exclusion doesn't exist, and there is a meaningful diversity that is thriving within your teams. Again, the functional areas of the organization has to be combined and aligned together to create just the right type of diversity the organization needs. So none of those things can be out there by themselves and it certainly cannot be owned. The work of equity, inclusion, and diversity cannot be just owned by the leadership or just executed on new recruit uh, programs. It has to be weaved throughout the organization. This is another feedback that I got in the survey. And this member said, I see DE&I aligning with and actively contributing to all of the tenets of MRA's mission. Because the more we implement successful DNI, our teams will be more close knit, closely knit, more creative, and more prepared for future challenges. When all members are given a seat at the table and feel valued, heard, and seen, everyone will benefit and our skills as mountain rescuers will only improve. This person makes a very important point. Having a seat at the table isn't good enough. That ain't gonna work. If that person is sitting at the table, not including the conversation, not welcome to share pers their perspective and value, that inclusion of sitting at the table is actually more dangerous and harmful than not being invited to the table at all. So I've been a token, and there's many other members, I'm sure, who's experienced tokenism, where they are invited simply because they represent a group of people that are not invited, but they're not really included and weaved into the fabric of that organization. That actually does more harm. So if we're inviting people to the table, we better make sure that uh, th th that person is truly included in the process and the conversation and what it is that we do together where in a, in a truly collaborative environment. So now that we discussed the, the mechanics of diversity, inclusion, and equity, we gotta think about something that's much more adaptive and emotional. And this is where the implementation and execution of uh, EID work can fail miserably, because I think this is where the challenge lies. And to me, without getting too fortune cookie-ish or Mr. Miyagi-ish, it really starts with this consciousness. What's going on up in here and what's going on in here? Things that we've been brainwashing conditioned to believe, the inner voices that tell us this is the way it has to be. This is the way it's always been. And being able to challenge those notions to learn new things and truly embrace growth mindset the spheres of consciousness that exist in our heads, in our hearts, and really looking at what is informing my decisions and my actions. As individuals, we're very complicated. It's not that simple. We're very complicated beings, very complex. There are many things that make up who we are and what we are. These are just some of the demographic identifiers that is either placed upon us or we embrace ourselves. Things like age, marital status, race, gender, what we do for a living, whether we have disabilities or not, and the severe severity of disabilities that we may have. And as of last full five years, boy or boy, political affiliation, 
what we choose to believe in and the level of education that we might have and how much money we make, all these things can serve to either combine and get us closer or divide us based on how different people's demographic identifiers or labels may be. So when we look at these demographic identifiers on the left, how many people do you really know? And I don't mean the neighbor that you just say hello to or the person that you get a cup of coffee from in the morning, but how well do you really know people that are different than you? They may have completely different perspective because their lived truth and their own journeys are so different from the one that you've been on. People who live in different bubbles, so to speak. If you don't have those people in your lives that represent different demographic labels or identifiers, people who lived in different bubbles that look very different than you was, then I can only imagine that your view of the world and perspective of the world may be skewed or limited or maybe even one dimension. So as an example, I teach, as I said earlier, it's easier for me to teach those students who are in MBA program or graduate school because they're closer to my age. I'm 50 this year. And average students I have in the MBA program are in their mid thirties, close to forties. So I can relate better. It is tougher when I walk in the room of an under, undergraduate class, because I feel like they're young. Well, I don't feel like it's a fact. They're young enough to be my children. And all of a sudden I take on the role of a father standing in front of the room, being directive and lecturing, even though that's what I'm supposed to get paid to do. And I don't really relate to the world that live in. At least that's how I approached teaching undergrad back in the days. And that's why I, I didn't want to teach it anymore because it's tough to relate to them. But over the years, I realized they're not that different. And I started remembering how I was as an undergrad student. I was a shitty student. So I realized all of a sudden I was being hypocritical to those students who are just like the way I was. And I certainly gained different perspective of how they think, boy, do they think differently. In some ways, much better than I do. And they see the world very differently. So I am exposed to, through my work, different groups of people in a completely different age bracket than I am. And I also have be, uh, friends who are single or divorced. So I get their perspective to things on marriage, partnerships, and life in a very different way. And I was raised predominantly by females, strong females, my grandmother, my mother, my aunts. So when I think about my perspective on life, it's been heavily influenced by the female perspective. And I still do because I have my wife and my daughter. So by including those and having a, a level of relationship with people from different demographics, regardless of these labels that I laid out here, and there are more obviously, you get to see the world very differently. And you get to see the world, the same world that you've been used to, slightly differently from their perspective. When you have a deep enough relationship with these people where you can have a tough conversation. One of my best friends, uh, he's a quadriplegic. And I, I met him in, when he was in wheelchair. And we realized, even though he came from a very different background, when he got injured at 19 years old, he realized as a white male that he was no longer uh, in a position to enjoy the privilege of being a white male, he said. Because all of a sudden, he was in a physical place where, where everything he saw was at a, at a level lower than everyone else. So he shares what minorities or people of color go through or uh, people of different se uh, sexual orientation or gender may go through. So by having these people in your life, providing the diverse perspective, it really does provide you a well-rounded perspective in the world, the one that doesn't necessarily exist in your bubble. Now, these titles are a little different. They're not demographic. 
These are roles that we play in our lives and the titles that are sometimes given to us and blessed us with. And I welcome titles like a father, brother, and a son. And I wear those titles and I, I play those roles with, with pleasure and integrity. So when we think about who we are, not just what we are, but who we are, it brings a different perspective to others as well. I like to think I'm a good father and I'm working towards it. But the way I look at the world and my children are very different than the way my wife does. Or only a mother can. Or only a person who's carried these human beings in, the, in, in their bodies for nine months and work so hard and give up their health to actually bring these individuals to the world. I could never gain that. I can't, because I can't live the truth that mothers go through. So by running things by my wife and looking at the same issue and the same children from two different perspectives, we can look at things differently and come up with solutions that are a lot better than what I could do as an individual. As a son, I have a perspective of parents. And my wife, as a daughter, has a different perspective as well. And so does my sister. So by having who we are labels, which these are, if we have someone who has a different perspective because of the roles they play, again, we, get, we gain an insight as to how different life is from their perspective. And the bubbles that we never got to live in. So the same train of thought applies here. As a teacher, how often do I see what I do from a, the per, student's perspective? Not just the evaluation I get at the end of the semester, right? But really engaging the perspective of my students from the other side of the classroom to make sure that I understand that what I'm delivering is truly meaningful and valuable for them. And always remembering what it was like to be a child and try to look at what I do as a parent from my children's perspective. Because oftentimes as we get older, we forget, right? We forget that we used to do naughty things, right? My son doesn't like to take showers every day. <laughs> my mother had to remind me that I was the same way, but I forgot. So this reminds us that we live in the bubble that we live in. And we don't often get a chance to interact with other bubbles and certainly put ourselves in that bubbles to see the world in a different way. So one of the questions that I would love to ask my audience, think about it, obviously this is a rhetorical question. How would you intentionally broaden and deepen your sphere of consciousness? What are the things that you are intentionally booking on your schedule that you're taking steps to understand and see and explore what different bubbles there are, how different lives, uh, different people's lives are. Even though we all live in the same world, our individual journeys are so different. So how can we go about doing this consciously and intentionally and investing our time and effort to really get to know someone who is different than we are? Now, once we do that, and we understand that there are different truths, that there are different journeys, not any better or worse, different. How would we go about doing this thing called practicing empathy? That word has been thrown on a lot. And I had a really difficult time trying to not only understand what empathy should mean, but how you go about intentionally practicing it. But it's not just something that you say or wear on your t-shirt or have it in a frame, but something that you, again, operationalize in your life. As always, I, I went right back to the dictionary to figure out what empathy means. And there's no surprises here, right? Can you actually see and feel something that's happening from, a, from another perspective, being in different people's shoes and looking at it from their perspective? That's what empathy is, an intention. Now, knowing is not enough, right? So, I may get to know my friend's perspective and I know what that is. And understanding what they may be go going through. And that's not enough either. 
intention is defined as an active instance of uh, determining mentally upon some action or result. Intention of wanting to practice empathy. Intention of wanting to be empathetic, especially when it's harder to do, especially when it's not popular to do, especially when it's scarier to do. We got to have an intention behind our thinking and feeling so that we can carry it on to an act, something we're actually going to do. And I don't, I'm not promoting that you go out and march. If you want to do that, that's on you. I'm not talking about acts that is grander. I'm talking about small acts, little things that we can do every single day that makes all the difference in the world. As a person of color, I've experienced hate from form of a, a racism, as well as protectionism. And those who thought I was homosexual, for whatever radar they were running, I also experienced what homophobia is like, and is scary, and is hateful. I've experienced bullying, and I've certainly experienced harassment and microaggressions as well. I've also experienced um, sexual harassment from a, from a gay man who was in, uh, in a position of power where I couldn't really do anything to say anything bad or fight back at the time. I'm not saying all this to win your sympathy. I'm saying all this to know, let you know that this is not something that I read about. This is something I live every day. If you have not experienced any of these yourself, how would you feel if your loved one has? And as a father, the thought of my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, experiencing sexism, misogyny, it breaks my heart and makes me angry. The thought of my daughter not being able to do what she's good at as a professional simply because she's a woman and she's been talked down to and passed multiple uh, promotions, that makes me angry. Because I can picture my daughter in the place of those who are victimized and harassed. The thought of my son being bullied because of the shape of his eyes makes me mad because that's something I live through. And I wanna make sure that doesn't happen in his life, but there's only so much I can do. So how would you feel if, never, if you've never experienced this ever in your life, how would you feel if it's happening to someone you love? You know, there's one thing, if there are any men in the room, which I imagine there are, and if you haven't experienced sexism, how would you feel if your mother was going through that? Because there's one thing that's unifying in this world. Every single one of us came from a woman. Now, whether you like your mother or not is a whole different story. However, would you like it if your mother was being harassed and sexually assaulted? If you watch the female team member being harassed by somebody else, a male team member, and you are able to picture your mother as a person who is being victimized, would you simply sit there and watch it happen or come up with some stupid justification as boys will be boys, that's a locker room talk? Would it be so easy for you to do that if it was your mother or your sister being attacked? So the hard question that we got to ask ourselves is when these things are happening and you're witnessing it, how would you react if it was happening to someone you love or your teammate? Someone who volunteers their time and risks their lives just like you do to do the humanitarian work, how would you feel? I hope there's some emotion being stirred up because you should be angry. And you have right to be angry when you see these things happen. When we are able to place the faces of those who we love onto those who are being victimized or who are being harassed or mistreated, I think it will encourage us and engage us at a different level to take action. And again, I'm not talking about necessarily doing something big where it's incredibly difficult to even imagine. I'm talking about small things like these things. Speak up. Speak up when you hear people spew words of hate and ignorance. You can simply say, hey, I don't agree with that. I don't see it that way. 
you can even take another step and speak back at them and go, you know what? That's not what we do here. Or you know what? If you were talking to my sister that way, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Or you can take a more softer approach and use humor sometimes to get back at them and, and help them realize their own ignorance. I, I do this quite often because I can't fight every battle, nor do I have the energy to. So sometimes I have to allow humor just to teach a lesson sometimes. So I'll tell you a quick story. I was flying from New York to Ohio. And I'm one of those people, when I get on the plane, I'm pretending I'm sleeping right away. So just so that I don't have to talk to you, right? I want to relax. I got a meeting to go to. I got to save up my energy because I'm, I'm an introvert. So I put my headphones on and I try to make sure that I'm, I'm, I look like I'm sleeping. Well, this guy next to me saw like a slight window of opportunity when I took my headset off to scratch my ear to ask me this question. He's like, hey, where are you going? I'm going to the same place you are. I'm going to Ohio. He goes, where are you from? So I said, New York. And this is what he said. He goes, no, 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 no. Where are you really from? So what he wanted to know was where these are from. Not my address, but where I grew up. So I said, I was born in Korea. He goes, I... I I thought I knew that. I thought I recognized that. You look Korean. I go, okay. He goes, um, I know a guy named James in, in Columbus. Do you know the guy? James Kim. So apparently in his mind, all Koreans know each other, right? So now I could have went after him and said, that's ignorant, that's stupid. Why would you say that? I just didn't have the energy. So this is what I did. I go, James, sure I know the guy. He goes, and surprisingly, he seemed somewhat surprised, even though he asked a stupid question, like he was expecting me to know him in the first place. So I said, yeah, I know James. Um, I've been meaning to call his parents, actually. He goes, how come? I go, well, you know, he hasn't been showing up to the meetings. And he goes, what meetings? Well, we have basement meetings. And he goes, you do? I go, yeah, we have basement meetings. He goes, I didn't know that. Goes, Why would you know that? Not for you. It's just the Koreans getting together in the basement. He goes, what do you guys talk about? I go, well, we talk about dry cleaning, we talk about running liquor stores, but we also talk about how to kill white people. And then I put my headphones on and right back to sleep, or at least pretended. When the plane landed, <laughs> he was way out of the line getting his luggage and getting the hell out of there and getting the hell off the plane. I really hope that he didn't take me seriously, but irked him enough and bothered him enough where he's not gonna ask the same stupid question next time he sees an Asian person. So this doesn't have to be confrontational. Think about your style. Think about your communication style. Think about the other person. Think about a way to deliver a message that may be meaningful. And it's not gonna take just one messaging, right? It's just complex work. What, you, what we're doing is tearing away years of brainwashing and conditioning to believe that some people are simply not as wordy as others. So we got to chip away with it, chip away at it. So it's going to take time. Sometimes simply standing in between, between the person who's being harassed or victimized and the person who's doing it to that person. Standing in between, you don't have to say a word. Standing right by shoulder to shoulder for that person, with that person, or simply standing behind the person, showing unity, showing that I got this person's back. Sometimes that's enough to, take to, to uh, for the bully to walk away, for the person who's being harassed to know that somebody does care. And in the worst situations, you got to call for help, whether that's the police, whether that's the fire department, whether it's the leaders, whether it's the person who is in charge of making sure something like this doesn't happen. Whoever that is in your organization and your culture, Calling for help is helpful. And if you are the person being attacked, you should also figure out a way to share that. Because if you're suffering from it, unfortunately, there are others suffering as well. You're not alone. And it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's on them, not on you. So you got to have a, have a way to be able to share these things with others and ask for help. There's no shame in it. Based on my experience, and I really do believe this. Otherwise, I, I don't think I can continue this work, which is largely there are more people who mean well 
who have the same values as we do, where all people should be treated with same level of respect. And we are all worthy, every single one of us. Then there are layers of people, a group of people that mean well. And I'm sure that guy who was sitting next to me asking me about James, I'm sure he's a nice guy. And he didn't mean to hurt me. Ignorance is, always, is not always hate. So, so sometimes they just don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And also they wanna help, but they don't know exactly how to. So there are groups of people that are out there. They can be influenced. They can be trained and educated and won over. And there's the bottom of the barrel. People who are so deficit minded, who believe in this, the hate they've been raised with, where you can try, the likelihood of them turning, shift, turning their minds around or shifting their mindsets and pivoting into meaningful action is pretty low. So I would like to focus on those who are practicing the values of equity and those who are curious, who want to, who want to learn more and be part of the good club, the good people club, people who can serve as allies. I wanna focus on these folks and see if we can get them to influence others, to create such a culture by purely by peer pressure that the right people would get off the bus on their own so that we don't have to kick them off. As our 32nd president once said, there are things we can do. We don't have to be the strongest. We don't have to be the richest. We don't have to have the biggest title. Let's do what we can with what we have where we are. And that may be a pat on the back. That may be simply speaking back to someone saying that is not okay. Doing the unpopular thing, doing sometimes the unsafe thing to make sure that someone else is safe. So these are some things that I would love for you to consider. I'm not accusing you, I'm not shaming you, but these are things that came to my mind as I got involved with MRA and I got to hear about what's happening, what's not happening, and the survey results and the lived experiences of the members. How do we reconcile the discrepancy between the humanitarian focus that you have as MRA members externally when saving lives, but not internally when it comes to your teammates? How do we reconcile that? We're volunteering our times, working for free to save strangers because lives are important and we're doing the humanitarian work. And yet, when we see our own team members being abused, harassed, or talked down to, mistreated, we simply turn away, turn our backs. We allow that to go on. And if there's anyone who's watching this right now who may be excluding people and mistreating people yourselves, how do you reconcile that? Do you go home and treat your loved ones the same way? I doubt it. So why is it okay then for you to treat someone else's daughter, someone, someone else's son that way? I don't think you would like it if someone else was treating your daughter or your son that way. We have to reconcile this. This is a tough conversation that we should be having. And I would like to ask those who come up with convenient justifications or simply waving off boys will be boys or that's how we've been doing things. Well, how do exclusive cliques, lack of diversity and exclusion and inequity actually support the mission of this organization? How do those things actually help or support quality, availability or safety? As that one member said earlier in this presentation, this is a safety issue. If people are shunned, people are afraid, people are not trained properly. It's a serious safety issue. How do we reconcile that? This is one thing that I really think we have to sink our teeth into. If diversity, inclusion, and equity are not practiced, could this be a safety issue? Could safety be compromised? 
Only you would know because I haven't been there. I'm not in your shoes. I'm not climbing mountains to save people. But could it be safety? Uh, could it be compromised? Could it actually come in the way and create barriers for you to, to do what it is that you're committed to do when there's someone else's life dependent upon your capability and your teamwork? So as we bring this to close, here are some things that we should consider to act on. I certainly hope that me uh, going on and on, on, on about equity, inclusion, and diversity this evening is simply left here. And you go back to your lives tomorrow and you never think about it. You've invested your evening on a Thursday, middle of the week, for this important work. So what are the things that we can actually carry on and execute? I think the first thing we need to do is make sure there's safe spaces. From what I've learned, there are safe spaces that are being intentionally created by the members. Those should be rewarded, celebrated, and supported. A safe space where we can have an open dialogue, where someone can share their truth, what is happening in their bubble, in their personal journey, that someone else may not be aware of. And when that someone has an experience the same, instead of making statements and discounting and dismissing that person's truth, ask questions. How does that work? How do you feel? What did that person do? How did that hurt you? Coming from a place of curiosity, and not judgment. And we have to have an ongoing process. This can be a one and done deal. One of the reasons why I agreed to work with uh, MRA is because one, I just simply fell in love with Fran. She was so engaging, so loving. And she was intelligent to a point, uh, uh, intelligent and deliver her points really well. And she was very direct. And I knew that Fran and Doug and Linda weren't doing this simply to check the box. That it wasn't one of those things that they're going to do because that's the popular thing to do. That they were engaged and committed to doing this work long term. So in this ongoing process, what are the communication that needs to go out? Not just from MRA to the teams and from the teams to the individual team members, but also getting it back from the feedback perspective. What's the two-way communication loop that you're uh, creating? and maintaining and nurturing. And also, how would you go about tracking these things? Tracking the inequities, the tracking the harassment, tracking how, how well we're doing. Not just the bad stuff, but the good stuff. What some teams are doing to create equity, what some teams are doing to truly be inclusive and engaging all the members. Again, you may not get down to the bottom level, but can you engage those who can be influenced to be allies? And then coming up with your own meaningful metrics and surveys, like an engagement survey, to explore, ex explore and include qualitative and experiential data from the members so that you keep uh, a finger on the pulse of what is really happening within the ecosystem of the teams as well as the organization. And can we practice growth mindset? It's, it shouldn't be just something that we say so that we sound smart. It's got to be practiced. And the first premise that we have to embrace is that you don't know what you don't know. So we have to be curious enough to ask and seek out what other people's journey is like and gain knowledge on what is it like to be in someone else's shoes so we can truly be intentionally empathetic. And not just getting to know your teammates on a level of what do you do, what are you good at, but who they are as people. Do they have children? Are they married? Do they have significant others? Are they a brother to a sister? Do you know their parents? Once you get to know who they are, it is really difficult to hate on them because you know when they go home, they go home to a bunch of people who love and care for them. It's hard to abuse those people when you know they're being loved just the way you want to be loved. That's the way you love your own family members. So the intentional act of empathy, knowing your sphere of consciousness, getting to know people who are different than you are, not just on the surface level,
but nurturing and grooming the relationship where you can have these intentional conversations that are messy and tough. And being able to build trust so you can ask these questions that you may, you may have never asked before. And the, the important work of equity, inclusion, and diversity has to be aligned with the mission of the organization. And I believe it is. Here at MRA, I believe it is aligned. So we simply have to serve the mission then, to we'll look through the mission through the lens of equity, inclusion, and diversity. Can we save lives through rescue and mountain safety education, but do so in an equitable, inclusive, and fully diversified team members and, and, and culture? I believe we can. The quality and the availability and safety of mountain search and rescue is dependent upon and should be aligned and supported by equity, inclusion, and diversity. They should be aligned. My assumption as an outsider looking in to MRA, the organization and the members, the fact that you're professional volunteers, you do this on your own time and you volunteer to do it, to save people's lives that you've never met. Equity, inclusion and diversity shouldn't be a question or a thing this foreign. I just feel like this should be part of what you do already. And I think for many of you, you do. So if there are those who don't, here's an opportunity where we can use the framework to invite them and join them. And not threaten them or shame them for what they're doing, but truly educate them and use this as an opportunity to get them onto the side of the good where people are respected for who they are, regardless of where they come from. That's what I had prepared for you tonight. So with the help of Linda and Doug, I would love to open it up for questions, if you have any, and I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, so if you, if you have questions, uh, if you want to use the raise hand uh, option uh, on the Zoom, go ahead and then uh, we'll, we'll get to those. So we've got Andreas has a question. Great. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, I, I understand the part where you have to provide the opportunities uh, to create the equity. Um, now, in a volunteer organization, um, the people who provide that have limited time too. So how, how to do that without even burning out the, these people and making it basically a second full-time job? Um, that is what I'm struggling with. So I would like to ask you a um, couple of questions just so that I understand where you're coming from. Uh, what I've heard you say is in order to educate and train people on equity that it will take more efforts and more time and it may hinder the, the fine balance of you know, work and life and volunteerism. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, from your own experience, um, what does equity training and what does equity education look like? That is what I'm struggling with. Uh, what, what, how, to, how to create equity, but there are different backgrounds on the team and we have to train them for a certain skill to be fieldable and how to approach that without getting into that circular problem you don't have the skills so you can't be there um, but you need the skills to be there yes so again forgive me as an outsider if I don't quite understand how it works but this is how I'm seeing it so um do you follow soccer at all, Andreas? Hmm. I'm German, so does that answer oh. your question? Thank you. <laughs> that was an educated question on my part. I detected the accent, but I didn't want to uh, be ignorant and just assume. So football, as we know it, 
uh, in the rest of the world. You can't have 11 strikers out on the pitch. We all know that, right? And we also know that the skill set that strikers have are very different than the, obviously the keeper or the defender. And we also know that the team consists of those who are on the benches, right? Uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a backup, but also those who are running onto the pitch to make sure someone's taking care of the physios, the conditioning coach. So there are different roles in every team. Now, if the team culture is dictating that only strikers are valued, only strikers are worthy on the team, because I, I heard of this term uh, doing this work in the, in the survey, that only those who are at the end of the rope matters. So there are, there may be some people who think strikers are the only uh, member that should be valued because they score goals and that's how you win. And the culture is such that those people are valued and no one else. Then the mindset would be, we have to train everyone to be the striker. But if the culture and the mindset of the team is, no, strikers are important, but they're not any more important than the person who's making sure our cleats are dry and our uniforms are clean and we have good nutritious meals so we can go out there and perform on the pitch. If the different roles are celebrated and appreciated, when you have someone who has different skill set, it's a matter of understanding what role they can play on the team to still add value to the collective work that we do. So I'm making a comparison and analogy with football, and it may not perfectly align with what you do as a volunteers because I haven't done mountain rescue, but I can't help but to imagine and assume that there's a correlation there. How can we celebrate different roles and skill sets? So we actually create the right fit for people where they can leverage their strength and the level of gap that we see as skill gap or talent gap to what they do is minimized. Does that make any sense? Yes, totally. I appreciate that. Uh, I totally understand that part. So now I have a follow-on question. Please. And that's more than what if everyone wants to be a striker and doesn't accept the role of just the other things? And that's really the, the culture you need to build. Um, I'm the first one to tell my daughter that, you know, she's not great at singing. And my wife says, that's New York directness. We don't want that in this house. But I don't want my daughter embarrassing herself out on, you know, American Idol. When I know she doesn't have the talent. She has different talents. She's very visually talented. So I am steering her into photography and visual design and, and visual arts. To do so, I can't tell her to do it, but I got to hold her hand and help her explore that. So that's also part of the leadership's role in that, how do we create a culture and a policy and a teamwork and a definition of what team looks like so that when people say, I want to do that, instead of saying, no, you suck at that, you shouldn't do that, but leverage their talents and recognize their talent and help them explore their talent to embrace different roles where they are contributing differently. And if they choose to want to learn skills that they really don't have the skill set in, then what? those are the outliers, right? That's the 20% you manage off the, uh, as, as the one-offs, but the other 80%, you have a culture and a process where you find the right roles and fit for the people based on their skill set so that you have less of a gap and celebrate that so it doesn't feel like they're just being dismissed as a lesser team member. But then the 20% of one-offs is where you may be able to figure out then how do we create a special path for someone? So it's not part of your regular operation where you burn people out, but you have a separate process for that. If people are really willing to commit to gain the skill set they don't have, to overcome the challenges of not having natural talent, to gain the skill set, how do you actually create a path for that? And is that something that the organizational team is committing to doing? And if it isn't, that should be stated upfront transparently to any members who's looking to join the team. Not to be exclusive, but to say, these are the standards that we maintain to make sure that we deliver the highest level safety. So that becomes part of the model and the culture. But it's coming from a place of, um, 
equity mindset, strength mindset, and growth mindset, not the mindset of exclusion because you suck, uh, a deficit mindset because your skill isn't just good enough. Does that make sense, Andres? Yes, thank you. By the way, do you have a favorite team? Uh, I grew up in Munich, so yes. Bayern? Yes. Fantastic. Awesome. Great team. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Was I that boring? Did people fall asleep over here? I was still here. It's very, very good. I, I think it's, it's a lot to take in and it's a lot of uh, deep thinking. Uh, so it's, it's very good. And this is, a, this is a marathon, it really is. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take a while. So I, I would love for people to think about this and obviously engage in conversations with like-minded people first and then be able to reach out to Linda and you, Doug, to continue on this important conversation. And, and certainly if, if you have any follow-on questions as you think about this uh, the, the next uh, day or so or, or whenever if something comes in, you can send me an email uh, at it's president at mra.org. I'll put that in the chat just so you can link to it if you want. And I can get that over to Jung uh, and Linda as well. I would love that. Janice has invited you to join us on a training sometime. Oh, <laughs> as long as I don't have to do the fiscal part, I would love to. <laughs> we always bring need, we, we always need people to ride in the litter so that sounds fantastic <laughs> what does that mean you'll find you'll out. find out <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute does that mean i have to bring my own adult diapers just in case <laughs> <laughs> no 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 uh, you just you just you can hike up and you get a ride down oh or That's maybe a helicopter ride out. We always, we always need people to, for training. I can play the dummy. <laughs> Great. Well, if there aren't any questions, I'd love to turn it over to Linda. What a Thanks, Sean. Yeah, really appreciate that. This was really great. You're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, just as follow up, like Zhang said, we need to have an ongoing process and the diversity and inclusion committee is working on that. Over the next few days, we'll be sending out a survey to the MRA to kind of gauge where we are now and, you know, maybe where some pain points are that we can start focusing on for the next year. A lot of time, um, a lot of feedback we've gotten is like trainings, you know, what, how can we structure that so that everybody is best benefited? So any feedback you have on those kind of topics as well, if you wanna send them to Doug to pass along, I'd appreciate it. And the other initiative we're working on is a, a way to collect anonymous feedback to understand um, like what's going on, what are people's experiences and that's both good and bad. If there's things that you've done that have worked and have helped people, you know, we want to hear those. We had uh, the resource group uh, last week or the week before, and there were a lot of questions on, you know, just, you know, how do we do this? How do we make this work? And there was a lot of good feedback on just, like Jean was talking about, little things that we can do, standing by people, standing between people, things that you know don't take a lot of bravery and aren't confrontational. So that's the kind of information we're looking for as well. So thank you to everybody who showed up tonight. I know we all have a lot on our plates. And like Andrea says, this can feel like a yet another full-time job. So really appreciate your dedication and commitment to coming tonight. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, um, Joe, do you got, have any closing? We, sorry, sorry, Doug. Oh, I sorry. think John just raised his hand. Oh, John yeah. Chang. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, thank you again, John, for uh, for a really uh, great talk. Um, oh, I actually uh, now that I have a opportunity to think a little bit about a question for you. Uh, one uh, comes up to mind is that uh, you, you know MRA right now we have you know 20, 30 participants to your uh, talk. Uh, it's very very informative. We all have great interests uh, in in this topic, uh, hence we're here. Uh, MRA, we have, I think, uh, about 2,000 members. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's uh, in terms of percentage, you know, the representation here is uh, fairly limited. And so, so that's one thing. Uh, but the question to you is, um, after having an opportunity to get to know us uh, just a little bit, uh, I'm kind of curious in terms of in your experience of working with other organizations and groups on this topic, how do you compare and contrast us? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our marquee is, you know, humanitarian efforts, you know, to serve on the benefit of others. And uh, this topic is pretty ubiquitous uh, these days in the, in the globally. And so I think I'm just kind of curious what your um, perspective is. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question, John. So I'll start with uh, correlation first. Uh, the correlation that I find or the common through line that I find with other groups that I've worked with is that um, especially those in uh, those organizations that are in groups of uh, organization of serving others, where you would actually assume that that those who choose to serve others would not treat people differently or mistreat or harass uh, or exclude because the work they, they, they chose to be in is serving, but it's not the case. Fire departments, police departments, nonprofit organizations. Um, so that gap, which I talked about earlier, how do you reconcile when your work dictates that you serve others and yet you don't serve within and those closest to you? That gap is consistent and I find I, I've, I've found that uh, to be uh, true in other organizations as well. The contradiction that I see, something unique to this organization, is I, I was invited by I believe Alexis, who's on the on the line, and Linda, on uh, what are the resources groups, and it was a safe space to share individual thinking and experience. And I won't go into details to respect the uh, integrity and the privacy of members who were there. Um, but what I found to be very encouraging, which is a contradiction to some of the other groups that I've worked with, is that there were people of different demographic identifiers, whether it was men, white, heterosexual, what have you, that were genuinely curious, that wanted to be an active and an intentional ally. And they were asking questions, as I said earlier. They were making statements. And they weren't doubting or second guessing uh, other members that lived in different uh, bubbles or had different journeys in their lives and certainly different personal truth. They were there to support. They were there to ask questions. They were there to learn. And that to me was very, very promising and encouraging. That's not something I see very often. Uh, most for-profit organizations that I work with any affinity groups that have members outside of that affinity group are there either for free lunch, because they usually have free lunches available, or their supervisors made them. So they sit there, they chow, chow down on their subs or pizza or whatever, and they add very little before they leave. But what I've witnessed in that meeting was truly a safe place where allies who have not experienced what other members have were there to learn and, and lend support and ask questions as to how to become more effective allies. So to me, that was a, a notable contradiction uh, that I saw in MRA that is promising and encouraging and exciting. Does it answer your question, John? Uh, uh, thank you. That was uh, very, very insightful. I really appreciate it. Uh, just uh, for background, I'm a 
uh, mountain rescuer for 25 years now, and uh, I just uh, the uh, Bay Area Mountain Rescue in, in uh, San Francisco. Fantastic. Thank you for the work that you do. Glad to see a brother in there. Awesome. All right, Doug, I think we're done. If you want to close us out. Well, great. Thank you, Jung. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, and thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, and, and thank you for the MRA for uh, supporting this webinar. Uh, this is, I think, a beginning and a, a very educational uh, and informative um, start to a uh, long-term uh, building of uh, inclusive and equitable teams um, as we move forward. So this is I'm excited as, as excited about how we're our future and how we're going to uh, move into it. So thank you. And thank you, Doug, and thank you, Linda, for this wonderful opportunity. Fran isn't here, but thank you, Fran. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to serve you. So thank you for this great opportunity. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.